What's happening, everybody? Welcome into a brand new episode of Crossed Up. Anthony Sanfilippo is here. I'm Bob Wankel. Phillies, Anthony, finally vanquished the Braves. Take three out of four. They had to They had to make it interesting. They always do. But three out of four against that team, the struggles that they've had against them this season, is still three out of four. They have a seven-game lead here on Labor Day. It would seem without putting the jinx on it, and I know everyone's listening, you can't say this, you're going to jinx them. That ought to do it in the NL East, yes? Yes. You're not blowing a seven-game lead with 26 games left or whatever the heck it is, right? I mean, I think it's less than that, actually. Um, Yeah, you're not... You're not. Let, let me go glass at full for like all the pessimists and people that hate Rob Thompson. The Phillies blow this division lead this month, and things will look mighty different next year, I will tell you that. Yes, correct. Correct. No, but I, you know, it's good. I mean, you know, you had to win this series, um, and and they did, and uh, they kind of made me look smart, Bob. Yeah, twelve and six over their next eighteen, right? Wasn't that your prediction? Uh, well, the, so the predict the prediction was twelve and six over eighteen, and it ended up being twelve and seven over nineteen. Yeah, so close. One extra. Game, the only one that the only one, and really the game that that got me in that whole stretch was the loss to the Marlins. I, yeah. I I had that chalked up as a win. Every other series went exactly as I. Well, listen, I'm gonna I'm gonna give you an excuse too because you couldn't have possibly thought that Taiwan Walker was gonna start that Astros game either. <laughs> no, I, so, didn't, I, mean, I like, didn't think yeah. that was the case. No, but so, I'm looking ahead. I, I, you know, in advance, I said, "Yeah, they're gonna take two or three from the Astros." I mean, when I was putting those numbers yeah. together in my head, that's how I got it. So, so yeah, they made me look pretty good this weekend. So uh, yeah, I'm 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 content. With a three out of four uh, series win against the Atlanta Braves, which I got—I can be honest, being down there for all four games, great atmosphere. Yeah, great fans brought it this week. You could really tell weekend. last night, yeah. especially. It felt like there was like this willingness, like this: we're going to will you to win this game and beat this team and send them home. And it, it came across uh, loud and clear on the television. So, yeah, yeah, great, good job by the fans because it it's been a it's been a fun atmosphere really all week. I mean, even the Houston series was pretty fun, minus the Taiwan Walker game. Um, but reality was it was uh it was a cool uh, cool experience starting to starting to feel like October again, Bob. Almost it, it sure does. And look, uh, this morning as you are taking stock of the Philly situation. You have to feel good about one thing in particular, and it's what you're getting from the top of your starting rotation right now. Zach Wheeler yep. was absolutely phenomenal on Saturday night, and I thought Aaron Nola was spectacular last night. It's just that nobody hit for him, and you didn't get that feeling like, oh, wow, he's really on tonight because you're you're watching the Phillies try to you know choke across a run, and your, your, your attention and your frustration is more on the offense than it is dialing in on Aaron Nola and how good he was. But you step back and look at what he did on, on Sunday night, a, a great job. And, and the way that those two were able to step up in big spots and important games for this team and deliver really solid performances, when you project out looking at October, man, it, it all starts with that. And that really is probably the single most important thing when you look at a team's playoff forecast, their outlook. Yeah, and you know the thing of it is, Bob, they win – 75% of the games that Zach Wheeler and Aaron Nola start. So if you're looking at a playoff series, right, you know they're going to get two starts each in a seven-game series. Well, that means that they're going to get you – you're going to win three of their four. Just, you know, mathematically. I mean, that's the way it works. That means you only would have to win one of the other three to win a series. And, and so, like, that's how important – those two guys are, and I, I think it gets overlooked sometimes. You sit there and say, "Well, it's only two guys, only two pitchers." But if if you're getting that kind of production from those two starters over the course of a of a month, and you're going to win seventy five percent of the time, then you're in a great spot. You're in a great spot. You just need other guys to, you know, step up and and do what they need to do at the right time and and win you one other game. And you can win a championship. That's that's how important Zach Wheeler and Aaron Nola are. Well, you certainly can, too, when you have those two guys and then you see what the, the main guys, the dudes in the Phillies bullpen were able to do this weekend and really what they've done now for an extended period of time after some hiccups in early August, mid-August. Jeff Hoffman, phenomenal weekend. Matt Strom made it interesting last night, but he's been very good lately. Um, Kirkering has been outstanding uh, his last handful of times out. Uh, 
Estevez, he looks like the guy that you thought you were getting when you acquired him. He's been great. I mean, he was he was incredible last night. He impressed me last night. Yeah. And, I, really and you know, I'm not a big Estevez guy. He impressed me. So you wonder, like, what does it look like uh, when you put him in the major market in the middle of a playoff race in important games and you're not just getting outs for a 71 win Angels team? And he is he's answered that call. I mean, he's he was really good for them uh, here this weekend. So you look at what they have in the depth in the bullpen, and this is the way you you kind of imagined it to be. Like we can we can beat you up top with the, the top of our rotation. We have some some quality depth in the middle of our rotation, which I do want to address here today. And then look, we're four or five deep, and we can come at you out of this bullpen and, and really go get you. And that's the recipe for success. That's the formula for success for this team. I will say this. If you would have outlined to me on Thursday morning that the Phillies were going to take three out of four games from the Braves, they would have a seven-game lead in the National League East on September 2nd, it would be really hard, I think, for me or anyone to pick it apart and say, all right, like, how do you not come out of that series feeling 100% confident that the Phillies are a machine, that they're the team to beat in October, uh, that they're all the way back, however you want to say it. And I, I will just say this. I, I found it a little bit aggravating this, this weekend watching this team from an offensive perspective. And I think the two things do need to be said here. The Braves have a good staff. They have a number of good bullpen arms. And we, they were on full display last night. Ronaldo Lopez. I, I just – my brain has a hard time processing every time I see him listed as a starting pitcher saying – this guy's going to be a problem tonight, that he's going to go out and give you six innings and only give up a run or two. I'm like, I'm waiting for the clock to strike midnight, but it's not. He's been phenomenal this year. Chris Sale right now, probably the, the front runner. He is the betting front runner in the odds anyway to win the Cy Young. Uh, the Phillies have no answer for Spencer Schwellenbach. I don't love Max Free, but obviously he's a good arm, a guy that can play at the top of a rotation. I get that. I get the depth and the strength of the Braves pitching at the same time. Holy smokes, guys. I mean, from an offensive perspective this weekend, the Phillies were – they were dreadful. As a team, they were 25 for 127 this week, this weekend. Four for 27 with runners in scoring position. But the inability and the continued inability to hit situationally, Nick Castellanos aside, it, it, it did – it's, like, weird. Like, I think that you have to pause and say, like, great job, great series – Yes, they are certainly in good position to make a run in a World Series, but also, could someone just show up? Could this offense with all these guys making $20 million just show up and pummel a guy one time? For as good as Aaron Nola is, the Braves get Aaron, get to Aaron Nola sometimes. For as, as good as Ranger Suarez is, the Braves get to Ranger Suarez sometimes. Can, can the Phillies get to one of these guys early in a game, drop three or four runs, and not make guys like Aaron Nola and Zach Wheeler have to be perfect? I mean, that's one thing that it's like, all right, Kyle Schwarber, it's time now. Hey, Bryce, hit the ball over the fence. Hey, Trey, like, like, come on, man, like up at the top of that lineup. Brandon Marsh, get down a bunt in extra innings. It's like it, that offense has to be better than this. They have to be better than this, Anthony. Yeah, they do. Um, I, and we talked about this already, Bob, and I, I'm curious. I'm going to be curious. The, the big thing in September for me is going to see the progression of Harper with you know the nagging quote unquote nagging injuries that he has with his wrist and elbow because i think it's more than that it, uh, and it we talked feels like it, it yeah and we, we we talked about it last episode where we said where it's where i said it looks like how he looked when he first came back from tommy john surgery where he was getting his hits you know he, had, he gets on base and, yeah, and he had a good weekend doing, he was active yeah. he had a couple of hits last yeah. night walk like i mean he had good at bats last night he helped this team win baseball games this weekend yes There's he no, did like, so and it's me like i'm ranting and raving here i want to be very clear bryce harper yeah. helped this team win baseball games and that and that's at the end of the day really what you're focused on but again where's my mvp guy right yeah yeah he's just he's not himself he was he was good but you need Bryce Harper to be great because that's what Bryce Harper is. And he's not been great for, for a while now. And I really do feel like it's because of what's going on in his arm in some capacity. And mm -hmm. I don't know if it's going to, I don't know if it's going to get better, Bob. I really don't. I mean, 
it, it was it was obviously an issue prior to last Monday. And then all of a sudden, the brace is back on his arm. Not the not the green one that he runs the bases with, but that black one that has the, the two straps. And you're sitting there saying, okay, wh why hasn't he worn that in a while? So it's bothering him more now than it was before. And he wasn't hitting before. Um, so he's kind of changed his approach a little bit. And yes, he's helping the team. Singles, doubles, walks, great. But you can't win a championship without Bryce Harper being Bryce Harper. He yeah. needs to. He needs to be. He, he doesn't have to go out there and be Aaron Judge and hit all you know fifty home runs. But he's got to. He's got to do more than one in the last month. I think that's all it is. Or something yeah, like that. Yeah, just to illustrate the point, he yeah. had two home runs in the month of August. He has not homered since August ninth. Yeah. Okay. That's I mean, that's month. that's tough. That's I don't think he's homered at Citizens Bank Park since July twenty. Fourth, I want to say, yeah. Something so his, like that. his two home runs in August, one came in Arizona, one came in Seattle, and then uh, yeah, July twenty seventh, that eight nothing win over the uh, Guardians on a Saturday night, the Tyler Phillips, Tyler game. Phillips complete game, Tyler Phillips. Yeah. So let me ask you, um, I think we all agree with that. Nobody listening to this would uh, would disagree that Bryce Harper has to be Bryce Harper in order for the Phillies to get to where they want to go. True. So the question is, how do you get Bryce Harper back to being Bryce Harper? Do you suspect that this is a situation where it's like, look, he's healthy enough to play and he is a, he is helping us win baseball games and therefore he wants to be out there and, and medically speaking, he can be out there. So we're just going to power through and see what happens and see what time does as, as September plays out. Or do you think that this is a situation where if you sat him down for 10 days, it would make all the difference. And would you sacrifice a depleted, a further depleted lineup, as I just spoke to the overall production of the lineup here over the, the past number of games, do you remove Bryce Harper for 10 days to try to get him right for October and play the long game, but in doing so, potentially miss out on, on chasing the Dodgers, who they're a game back of right now, and, and you know fending off the Brewers, who they're a game ahead of? Yeah, and, and this, is, this is the negative that has come up as far as the extended bad stretch that they had that, you know, was a month long, you know, started with that Oakland series right before the all-star break and into August um, is, is you gave up your cushion in those uh, over those two teams. They actually stayed the course against my, against the Braves, right? In the NL East is, you know, the Braves kind of got back in it a little bit. The Phillies are right where they need to be. Seven games up is a really comfortable spot. But they gave up the, the ground that they had on the Dodgers and Brewers. And now you have to, as you go into this final month, Bob, you have to weigh the, the two. You have to sit there and say, do we want to finish one or two? Or do we do we rest Bryce and risk falling to three and having to play in the wild card round? I'll tell you that they're going to go for one and two. And, and with the thought process of if we get one of those two, it gets Bryce a week off. Mm -hmm. or almost a week off. And that's just as good as resting him for a week down the stretch. And that way we don't have to worry about playing a best of three series against somebody. I, I, I think that's the approach that they're going to take. It's probably the right one, but I do, I do see the pitfalls in playing him straight through the end, because let's be honest, you might lock up the division, you know, with 10 games to go, but you're not locking up the number two seed with 10 no. games to, that's going to come down to the bitter end yeah well i i think it's it's something that you have to monitor especially as you get to the back half of september i would like to see if possible if there is a way to just string together three or four or five days where you could keep him grounded i i would if if the injury is such that that rest will and as most injuries are rest will and to improve them over trying to play through it at a professional level, I mean, it might be a risk that they have to at least consider if if they think that there's going to be that positive correlation. I'm not saying sit them for 14 days, but if you can get a four game lead and and you can clinch that thing with five games to go, clinch a top spot, you know, clinch the yeah. first round by, man, I would consider it. Like I I think there's a couple of opportunities to maybe get them a game here and there. Like I think. This coming road trip, you could probably get him a game in Miami and not not risk hurting your lineup to, so much. I think that there's a possibility of maybe, uh, you know, against Tampa, 
Look, maybe you can you can maybe sit him one of those games as you prepare for that big stretch of Mets, Brewers, Mets, Cubs, right? right? And then, of course, the last weekend of the season against Washington, depending on where you're sitting, if you have a comfortable lead there, you're up two games in the Isn't final Isn't it three, amazing to Mets, Mets, Brewers, Mets, Cubs? Like, you think through that and at a time, if you looked back maybe 45 days ago, you'd say, like, okay, uh, things in middle and back end of September really ease up for you here. But the Brewers are obviously right there. Uh, the yeah. Mets have been goodish. You know, they've one, one thing that you, you credit the Mets for doing is they've beaten up on bad teams and they've gotten themselves back into it. And Lindor has been playing at a not an MVP this year level, but he's he's been for two months in that like fringe conversation. Um, not easy. The Cubs all of a sudden, like out of nowhere, the Cubs were, they were my, they're gonna be they're gonna be my one last thing today because like I they're think they're trading off pieces. They kind of remind yeah. me of that 06 Phillies team that was like, we're out. We're gonna trade a bird, like we're gonna trade off all these pieces, or is it 05? One of those two years where they basically sold, they trade a Brayu, like we have no shot, and then they make this run up against it. They don't get in, but they yeah. were better down the stretch once they kind of called it off. That's what the Cubs are doing right now. Smiley, yeah, see you later, Nara, see you yeah. later. I mean, it, uh, I mean, who's who was the trade that they did with um with Tampa Bay? Was it uh Paredes for uh yeah, Isak? They got Isak Paredes. And, and, then, I, and we were wondering what the hell they were doing. Like, right. why are the Cubs going after Isak Paredes? Well, so like, and, I was at Wrigley. Yeah. Like, I was at Wrigley when they played the Blue Jays a couple weekends ago. And the vibe, even at that time, was like, yeah, you know, like, just kind of going through the motions. They're going to win 80 games. Now we're looking at them as a, a potential wild card team. But the reason is, like, the point is, is that that stretch is now looking quite, quite challenging. And it yeah. kind of brings up this question that I have. Like, I'm looking at the Braves and I'm, I'm sort of like at the point where I don't want to see the Braves. You know, the Phillies did what they needed to do this weekend, but also this pitching staff has has really gotten the better of the Phillies offense all season. And I'm like, man, if you could avoid the Braves, that would be great. But here's my question to you. Number one, are you like, do you fear the Braves in a playoff series just because over time again, like here you are third straight year division rival, good pitching staff. Like that's a tough out for the Phillies in the playoffs, especially in a short series. On the other hand, like, are the Braves even making the playoffs at this point? Because you look at those right. wild card standings, and it's like, oh boy, they got some work to do here. Yeah, no, I don't, I don't fear the Braves. I mean, you, I think the one thing that you you did see in this series uh, with uh, Friday uh, is the lone exception. The Braves' offense is not very good, um, and the fall off after Olson is like crazy. Well, and even Olsen's not having a good good year, right? I mean, but but you're right. I mean, it drops the bottom of their lineup is terrible. That they, they you know, for all the bitching we do in Philadelphia about the Phillies can't hit with runners in scoring position. Yeah, the Braves were 0 for 10 last night with runners in scoring position. Yeah. 0 for 10. They get one hit with runners in scoring position. That game's they lose. Phillies lose that game. Right? How I mean, bad was how bad was Orlando Arcio last night? Oh, <laughs> he's like, terrible. Just, he's terrible. just terrible. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, so that's the thing. Like, so like, ultimately, yeah, you're right. Their pitching is good, and it keeps you, it keeps them in games, and it, um, those games would be tight. But you know what? Most of the time, I when I think of playoffs, I don't think of oh, you're going to roll over a team, you're going to blow out a team. I think games are usually going to be close. You might get the one game here or there that goes, you know, gets a little bit away from a team. Okay, fine. But in the playoffs, games are going to be close, and I I think that. The Phillies show that they can win close games against Atlanta. That's the one thing about, yeah. even though they lost the season series, they went six and seven against them. A lot of the Phillies wins were close wins, right? So they yeah. show they can win those close games. So no, I'm not worried about the Braves so much as a, as a playoff opponent, nor do I worry about Milwaukee. That's why I think that the number two seed is, is a good spot for the Phillies. Let those teams out West who are playing good baseball, Di Diamondbacks again yesterday with a big win. Um, like, like let those teams beat each other like yeah. go through each other and you only have to face one of them in the lcs which is a seven game series instead of a four game series and you have the pitching advantage uh it, it becomes even greater when you have a seven game series instead of a five game series all right so let me ask you this the phillies this weekend basically won three out of four games with the absence of a leadoff hitter yeah. um this is this is problematic for me because if you've listened to the show uh, 
over over the past two and a half, two and three quarter seasons. If you listen to it after that Dodger series, I, I went back to something that that I've said numerous times, and it's that Kyle Schwarber's the guy. Like he sort of is the the straw that stirs the drink. He's a clubhouse leader. He's a big game player. He's a difference maker. Like I. I when it's all said and done here, if Kyle Schwarber never has another hit for the Phillies, I would tell you that his addition to this clubhouse was invaluable. It, just a, a net positive, a total win. That all said, what on earth is going on with Kyle Schwarber right now? You go back to August 9th, talk about Bryce Harper's last home run. Well, mm-hmm. August 9th, 21 games, Kyle Schwarber 10 for his last 83. Yeah, his it's goal. 11 for it's 11 for 88 if you go one more game than that. 22 so, games and one home run. Like, yeah. What the hell is going on? And not walking. So what was he this weekend? Two for 16, I think with two walks. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's just, it's just not happening right now. So I'm not like a big change up the order guy. If you think the Kyle Schwarber a month from now is going to be your lead off hitter, then, and he's been your lead off hitter for every game this season, then just make him your lead off hitter. Like I, I, I suppose it's not about what you do with him in the lineup as far as I'm concerned. It's just a matter of like, okay, so Bryce Harper's power has been sapped and we're like, well, I must be hurt. Kyle Schwerber. Okay. Is he just, I know he's a streaky hitter. This is sort of like in his DNA, his offensive profile. I, I guess I wouldn't be surprised if this week he hit five home runs and he was 11 for his next 16. Like I, I know that that's always right around the corner with him, but at the same time, I kind of thought that was going to happen this weekend. Like I have this thing in my head with this team where I'm like, okay, the lights are on now. He's a red light player. This is a red light series bet on Kyle Schwarber. And it, it just it isn't happening. Yeah, I, I think he's another guy that could use a day. And I know he's just a DH and he's not out in the field, but I think it's more of a mental fatigue thing mm-hmm. maybe for him where he's trying to figure it all out in his head and – thinking thinking through at bats and like you know you texted me last night and you're spot on with this every at bat that he has feels like you're starting in a one two count yeah like, it just feels like that i mean he's constantly behind and that's part of when when schwarber's going good he's either attacking that first pitch and driving it for a hit somewhere or he's ahead in the count yeah constantly and right now he's nowhere close and and so Part of that, you know, we asked Rob about it. He feels that part of it is overswinging a little bit. Part of it is try, you know, trying to do too much. When he says trying to do too much, I think in this instance, it's the the notion of the team's not hitting home runs. So Kyle feels like he needs to hit home runs. Yeah. But if he gets it, 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 really every player on this team, and this is where, this is where I credit Rob a lot with, with being able to kind of trust guys to get to certain spots. Uh, Every guy on this team, when they struggle to get out of it, they they use the whole field. They hit the opposite way, right? The, uh, Schwarber's never going to hit the ball down the left field line, but he needs to hit the ball to left center and up the middle, okay? And he's not doing that. When he starts doing that, even if he's making outs, that's when you'll know he's coming out of it. Well, maybe, and, maybe, and maybe the conversation is different this morning if we take his, his at-bat in extra innings. He hits a 111-mile-an-hour dart to center field right at Harris, yeah, and you yeah, go, yeah. it's frustrating in, in multiple ways because you're like, just just roll one over to second base. Like, yeah. just move the runner. I don't care if you hit a 17 hopper. Just move him. At the same time, it's frustrating because you can't hit a ball much harder than that. They actually said it on the broadcast last night. They said balls in play at that that speed, that exit velocity, carry like a 750 batting average this season. Yeah. So it's frustrating too because it's kind of fluky that he makes an out. But maybe the conversation is different if that thing lands. And we say, oh, look, Kyle's back. Big big game player, comes through again, puts all of his struggles recently behind him and, and gets it done. So I know baseball is like a funny game and sometimes we look at results to drive narratives. I understand all of that, but – this is now three and a half weeks, four weeks where you're like, okay, uh, you got you got to have a little little bit more than that for me here, bud. Yeah, I I mean that's why I, I wouldn't be surprised if again I I think he's a guy that could use a day. Maybe you wait till the Marlins series and you give him a day, one day. You give Harper a day, one day. Like you figure you figure that kind of out and you try and get them, you know, as rested as possible. 
uh, going into the end of the season and, and, and for the playoffs. But he's got to get going. Like, he's not a guy that's just going to take five days off after the last game of the season before the division series, assuming they get the bye, and just suddenly be, okay, he's ready to roll. Right. Like, he's got to, he's kind of, He's got to kind of get going a little bit before then. Still time, but he's got to get going. Um, I have a, a thing here that I'd like to point out. Whit Merrifield, okay? He, <laughs> on Monday night, went five for five against the Twins. And, you know, Philly Twitter does its, like, thing that it always does. Like, of course he did. Oh, now he's Mickey Mantle. Look at him. He's, you know, Roberto Alomar. And, uh, typical. Whit Merrifield is cooked, Okay. Like, great that he, I'm like not rooting against him. I'm not saying that he's like, shouldn't be in the league anymore. I don't know, but he's cooked and he was cooked here and he's, he's done. And like, I haven't seen everybody tweeting every two seconds about Whit Merrifield's one for 26 that he's in the middle of right now. So since that five for five, oh, for six, oh, for five, oh, for four, oh, for five, one for four, oh, for three, a couple of annoying walks late last night where you're like, are you seriously walking this guy? Guy's in the middle of a one for 25, and we're walking him in the seventh inning and in extra innings. But like, what Merrifield? Come on, man. And it was nice to see that play doesn't get made. The exchange late. He's not at the bag. Harper's safe. Gives him an extra out. Boom. There were some um, some people. I don't I don't I don't want to identify who they are, but I'll tell you off there. But there's some people who kept saying um that. He was out of position the entire series at second base. Like he was never where he was supposed to be. And I didn't look, I didn't pay that close attention to it to sit there and say, oh yeah, you're right. Yeah. But that double that that play that you're just that you just brought up, if he's in the right spot, that's an easy double play. He's out by three steps. He was almost right? out anyway. Olsen almost got him. Right. Right. So it's kind of for all that, you know, oh, he turns a great double play. Right. Sure, he does. Just, you know, he's fast at the bag. He's still got that, but he's got to get there and he yeah. didn't get there. Yeah. <laughs> that's that's old man right there. He stinks. <laughs> Next time Whit Merrifield goes two for five, Philly sports Twitter, relax. Relax. <laughs> I'll see. He's got more hits tonight than he did for us all season. Typical Phillies. <laughs> The team's in first place by seven games. It's all right. Uh, okay, Whit Merrifield uh, can go play out the string with the Braves. Be all right. Yeah. Um, you look ahead here. Um, uh, I'll tell you what. Like, I just, I think I, I'll just do what I was kind of criticizing. Like, I'm programmed for anxiety. I go Blue Jays, Marlins. Uh, I don't know. Like, is that really that easy of a week? Are they gonna? Um, are they going to keep your foot on the gas or here now and, and just mow these four teams down? Four and two is that? Yeah, okay. Four two. I, I mean, like I, look, I you, you know me, I I look ahead at all the time, right? And so, like, I I honestly think the Phillies are going to be five games over five hundred the rest of the way and and finish ninety six and sixty six is what I, the way I look at it. And I think that that'll be good enough. Ninety six and okay, all right, ninety six. Yeah. That was actually something yeah. I have for you today. Like, where do they where do they land? You know? Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I, a lot can happen in that last week if if things go, you know, a certain way and whatever, you know, if Milwaukee falls off for some reason or whatever. I mean, things in that last week could be different. But I look at it and say, uh, you know, split Toronto and win three out of four against Miami. And then you're probably winning each of the two home series against Tampa and the Mets, probably losing the series in, in Milwaukee um, and maybe split in New York. And then win two out of three against the Cubs, win two out of three against Washington. And that gets you to 96 and 66. Is your expectation the Phillies are the two seed? Is that where this yes. lands? Yeah, I think so at this point. Look, and, and it's possible they catch the Dodgers. It's just that the Dodgers' schedule is a little bit easier than I thought it was. You know, yeah. as as I as I kind of like started to look at these. Um, and I thought that they were gonna have a tougher schedule. And they do have a, a stretch of tough games. Um, coming up, I mean, after they play Arizona again today, wraps up that series. They have two with the Angels, and then I get the little tough stretch: Cleveland for three, the Cubs for three, and the Braves for four. So I mean, that's that's not an easy stretch for the Dodgers. 
Right. But then it wraps up Miami, Colorado, three against San Diego, which is a good series, and three more against Colorado. But six of your last nine against the Rockets. I mean, yeah. so like I think in the end, of, in the end, the Dodgers are going to probably snake the Phillies by a game or two. All right, I have I have two things I want to talk about, and it's I, I messed this up because like I I went like, hey, great job pitching staff, offense, what the hell, and then in doing so, we just didn't talk about Nick Castellanos. So I I want to talk about Nick Castellanos, and not just about the numbers or the consistency, but I have another thing I would like to introduce into this conversation about him. Before we yeah. get to that, though, I, I want to talk about Austin Hayes, and I want to know what your impressions of of Austin Hayes are at this point. Um, I think he's played nineteen games now with the Phillies. He's hitting almost like, I think it's about 250. It's OPS in like mid 600s. He, he has not been a difference maker for this team. Um, he hasn't been terrible though, either, I, I guess. Is, is this is this all he is? Okay, so a few things. Number one, is this all he is? And then number two, how do you use him? Is, is he really going to be this everyday guy where you just pencil him in and this is what we're doing? I, I'm conflicted. The reason why I ask you, and I don't have an opinion to, to share with you on top of it, is because I'm not sure. There's a small part of me that's like, this guy is very, very mediocre. Very mediocre. Then there's part of me, it's like, there's got to be something more in there. Yeah, it's a great question, Bob. And I, I look at it, and the way I answer it is this. He's absolutely in your lineup against lefties. We know he can hit lefties. He, you know, should have had a home run uh, and would have had three hits against Freed, um, were not for that incredible catch by Michael Harris, which we didn't even talk about. Maybe the best catch I've ever seen live at a game, and it's certainly top five I've witnessed, even on television. Was it better than the? Uh, was that the best catch in Citizens Bank Park history? Better than Aaron Rowan's. Yeah, I agree. It's better than Aaron Rowan's. People, but yeah, it's going to upset people, but there's no question it was. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so Austin Hayes plays against lefties. Um. The thing about right-handers is it, it kind of depends a lot on Brandon Marsh because I understand you want to maybe say, okay, maybe get Rojas into the game. Oh, someone's at my front door. Thank you, Alexa. Um, but uh, maybe you want to get Rojas in some games, but I'd rather Austin Hayes at 250, 697 OPS with the ability to potentially do something that's more than just a weak ground ball and try and leg it out. I'd rather that than Rojas in my lineup. So, like, do I think he's a small upgrade? I do. I don't know how, and they're not, that's not has anything to do with my house. The cops flying by, uh, <laughs> or the person at the door. Um, anyway, the, uh, yeah, no, I, I think that it's a marginal upgrade over what your other alternative is. But if Brandon Marsh isn't is hitting, maybe the platoon is more Rojas Hayes and less Rojas Marsh, if that makes sense. So if if Brandon Marsh can 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 freaking figure it out over the final month yeah, like in a weird weekend like a, a good, again yeah. somewhat like encouraging week he's been better we were talking yeah. about possibly giving him a two-week breather in lehigh two yeah. weeks ago and so what he's at least done here is gotten up off the mat and is has been productive in spots obviously hits a massive home run on thursday night totally changes that game um great has three hits, I believe, over the weekend. Uh, three for ten, is that correct? Yeah, it's zero for four last night, though. Zero for four last night, and then and then doesn't get a bunt down late in the game, and it, yeah. you know certainly that was frustrating. Um, we'll see. You know, signs of life, but still certainly very inconsistent. Yeah. So I mean, I you know you ask about Austin Hayes, and I'm fine with Austin Hayes batting ninth and in my lineup if Brandon Marsh can be. A regular contributor like he like he's supposed to be yeah. but if he's not if he's striking out three out of every four times he comes to the plate and just not doing anything well then what are you going to do like i mean it, it's you have to play him i mean like it, it's it's a tough call dude it really is it, like, you've said it yourself a couple episodes ago when you said um it's a it's the biggest problem on the team right now is the fact that they only have one outfielder yeah, because they really do. They they have four guys to play two spots, and none of them are regulars in in our minds. 
So. so let's talk about the one guy that they they do have out there uh, who won them the game last night. It was really their only offense last night. Um, drove in all three runs. Comes in a tough spot in, the, in that in that final inning. I mean, you know, you're not expecting him to get a hit there. I know that they made a mistake, but he took advantage of it. And uh, he, he actually hit two mistakes last night. And that's, that's what good hitters do. They hit those mistakes. Mm-hmm. We've talked about the consistency. If you go back to, you know, pick a date, June, whatever, he's hitting 300, his OPS in the mid 800s, and he's been a model of consistency. Like we've had that conversation. You know, it's it's like you you see what happened in the postseason against Arizona last year, and I don't want to say, oh, look, Nick, Nick Castellanos is a, a big game player because he was dismal in that series and he killed him, and he, he wasn't a big game player. But right now, I, I keep the thing that I've wanted from this team for, for two months is to kind of step on the throat. Whether or not this is real at the at the professional level, I think guys like me that are around high school sports and you see openings and you want a team to have edge and, and have energy. And I'm a believer in killer instinct. I'm a believer in not necessarily momentum, but like the, a feeling where you're like, we're going to go now and we're going to do it. And I think that this Phillies team has lacked that. I think that the Phillies lacked it in 2022. Uh, in the World Series, I think that they thought they accomplished something midway through that series. I do, I do. I could be wrong. Th- these guys, if you played this for them in that clubhouse, they, maybe they'd say like, "Idiot." Fine. I think they. I, I certainly think they did it against Arizona. I believe if you, you know, truth serum. These guys are seventy-two years old. You ask them, did you think that series was over when you won Game Five and you put it on autopilot in Game Six, and then you probably didn't put it on autopilot in Game Seven. But by that time, you got got because that's the sport. I think that they took their foot off the gas in that Arizona series last year. I do. I think they took their foot off the gas this season after they built that lead. I'm, I've been waiting for this team to drop the hammer, and there was one guy that did it. There was one guy that did it this weekend and did it in big spots on two nights, and it was Nick Castellanos. And I know Bryce Harper was on base a couple times. I know that Brandon Marsh hit the three-run homer on Thursday night. Pitching staff was great, but from an offensive perspective, there was one guy that was a real killer this weekend. It was Nick Castellanos. You buy yeah, him it, No, I well, I buy it because I, I've been I've been telling you guys for months that this guy is going to figure it out. Like you don't have an eleven year career where you are, you know, a near eight hundred OPS hitter, and then suddenly because you have one horrific month are not going to be able to get back to being that guy at some point. And, you know, we don't need to go into into the statistics specifically, but, but the one I will bring up is, and I looked this one up myself, so I have one prepared for you, Bob. Um, but since May 3rd, this I went back all the way to May 3rd, So because we're four months, because tomorrow will be, be four months on this. Uh, he has better a better OPS than he has in his career. 796 and his his career OPS is 793. So the guy has been incredibly consistent. And I think when you talk to him and we talk to him a lot, he could just because he's such a great quote, right? But we talked to him a lot. Did you catch the uh, first game interview last night? so, So good. So good. So good. He, I think he, it does it intentionally now on these national telecasts yeah. that he's really being being that way. Uh, it was painful too. Like sometimes I'm like, yo, man, just answer the question. Like you know what they're driving at. Last night, yeah. he could have been he could have been way worse. Like he could have really I was almost surprised when she asked the question about the, the phone going off and saying it was his phone. I was surprised he didn't just put the headset down and walk away. Yeah. <laughs> I know that would have been funny. That would have been great. That would have been an all timer if he did. It was, um, yeah. But you no, know, I think that when when you when you talk to him, you get the sense of this is a guy that wants it. This is a guy that is doing th- some stuff every day to to get that ultimate goal, to get that ring. He wants it maybe more than almost anybody in that clubhouse. Mm-hmm. I mean, it, you know. I, you see it. I, I, I've there was a couple of days this week where I had to get down to the ballpark even earlier than usual. Um, I had meetings that I had to be part of for work that were 
uh, you know, at, at a time that would have made it hard for me to get to the ballpark on time. So I got down there to the ballpark early and worked my day job from the ballpark. And so I walk in there. There's nobody there but me. I'm the only guy in the press box. And you know who's on the field hitting? Nick Castellanos. And, and, and that's a thing that, you know, most people don't see. And, and you know, you, we could talk about it all we want, but this has been something that he has done with regularity, and I mean almost every game. There's been a couple of days he's taken off, but almost every game where he's been out there working by himself with Paco Figueroa um, and just hitting, 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 and it's changed his two-strike approach. Rob talked about it last night. He's chasing less. He's only his. He's got his strikeout rate down in the second half of the season to under twenty percent. Think about who we're talking yeah. about. This is a guy that a year ago we were talking about how he was striking out 35 percent of the time, and he's got it down to under twenty percent in the second half of the season. Like that's work that it's being put in, and you're not putting that kind of work in unless your ultimate goal is to win the whole damn thing. And so he has that killer instinct and he has that drive and determination to get there. I think the other guys do as well, but I think that you're right in a sense that some of them maybe took the foot off the gas to say, let's save it for October. Well, I know what happened last year is ultimately what everyone latches on to. And he was not good in 2022. There's enough of a history here where I understand the, the reluctance to just fully embrace him. I get it. Yeah. At the same time, Hey, Trey Turner definitely needs a day. Uh, obviously, Bryce could use a few days. Maybe Kyle could use a reset. You ever say that about Nick Castellanos? Have you said yeah. this is a guy that is is consistent consistent as it gets? He's there every single day, and you don't feel like oh he needs a day or oh obviously. I mean, look, look, he probably needed a day from a mental standpoint early on. I, I'm surprised that they just kept doing it, but in hindsight. Maybe that was the right thing to do. I mean, he played 157 regular season games last year, and right now he might play 162. Yeah, that's a target of his. He and we you don't know, we don't talk about this. Like for all, like, I'm not saying that it's it's soft not to need rest. By the way, like I right. just advocated for Bryce Harper to sit down for a few days, or you know maybe Kyle Schwarber does need a reset. Or I'm all for that. I'm not saying that you're weak or soft or undependable if that's the what you need. But this guy just comes in and he's for, for three months been their most consistent hitter. And we don't even talk about taking him out of the lineup or needing a day. Yeah. No. And the, and the thing about him that's even better, Bob, and I know he talked about it earlier this week when he talked about the higher he hits in the lineup, he feels like he gets better pitches. That's all well and good. Um, but he can hit anywhere in the, in the lineup. They've batted him everywhere. They've batted him second this year. They've batted him fourth. They've batted him five, six, seven. Like, he's anywhere in the lineup, and he's still going to be the same guy. No matter what, he's going to be the same guy. So, like, there's there's something to that as well that well, he's – Well, this he is the conversation. To, yeah, you know how I ahead. feel about lineup conversations, but I do think it's an interesting time to talk about this because certainly he's, he's had some big hits. He knocks in three runs last night. He wants to hit preferably, not that he's demanding it, but he'd like to hit more in the middle of the lineup, be protected better, get better pitches. Makes sense. Is there, can you make the case to hit him clean up at this point and slot down boom? Or do you still think I, I, when it's about putting the ball in play, you know, two strike hitting boom is just better or has been better. If you look at the entire year, I know he's been dreadful lately, but boom still presents a better approach because they don't have a classic cleanup hitter. They don't, they don't have, you know, boom, you know, 300 hitter, 38 home run guy. So do you just take boom's, ability to put the ball in play and and bank on that or do you use nick who has a little bit more ability to do damage uh like how do you see that i i think ultimately you're probably sticking with bohm at four and castellanos five because bohm's bohm's not a power guy e either i mean what castellanos is more of a power guy than bohm is but you want to you want to lengthen the lineup a little bit and and i think having Castellanos at five gives you just a little bit more because I don't I don't necessarily know how I feel I don't Castellanos isn't an on base guy right I mean for right. the, he never he no, doesn't he walk not, no. right so it, it, Alec Bohm needs to kind of drive guys in 
to be like to, to utilize what Bohm does well. He needs to have guys on base in front of him. And, you know, if you put Castellanos in front of him, now you're talking about putting a, a guy in front of him who's not an on base guy. Mm-hmm. And, and I don't know if that helps Alec Bohm at all. I, I think it protects Bohm a little bit to have Castellanos behind him. So I, I think ultimately, come the playoffs, it's going to be Castellanos five. And you're probably looking at Stott six, Real Muto seven. Marsh eight and then Hayes nine is probably what you're looking at. What did you think of Bryson stop bunting in the tenth inning last night? Awful. Oh, the worst that not give you that was worst maybe out of the game. One of the most concerning things that came out of, of this weekend for me was to me what that said was I don't think I can do this. Let me leave it up to JT Real Muto. Yeah. Isn't that like is that not what that felt like? Yeah, completely. It's the, it's not the it's not the right play there. It's just not. I'm gonna tell you. I'm just I'm gonna tell you this. They have a an issue in that infield after this season. Like I think there's enough there that you can win the World Series and all of that, but they've got some things to figure out between second and third base. And really, the shortstop we know will be here, but I don't know that he should be where he's at either. Right. So I don't know if it's just play the hits. You know, Alec Bohm's here and. I, I just don't know that Bohm and Stott work together. That's my opinion. No, I don't, it, it's I don't fair. think it's good enough. I don't think that those two are good enough is, is what I think. So if there was together, one, but together. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If there wasn't one out, I don't hate it as much. Right? But it was one out. Yeah. Like, what are you doing in that spot with one out? Trying to get you only need the one run to win the game. Like, what the hell are you? A single is what you needed in that spot, and you're not beat. I mean, I don't know. Maybe you're beating it out. You're trying, but to me, even if you're trying to bunt for a hit, you probably want to drag it to first, right? I I, it didn't make any sense to me. It didn't make any sense to me, and then end up being just a flat out awful. Was that that was the tenth inning, right? Did I misspeak? It was or was the ninth? I think was the, it the ninth. ninth, or ninth? Yeah, it was late. Ni- uh, ninth inning. Okay. Look at the score. Yeah, yeah Harper ninth. walked. Cassiano yeah. struck out, and that was yeah, the that, one. Right, right, because he would have. Igl- Igl- yeah. Iglesias got him chasing. Right, he got took, really got him chasing. Yeah. Um, and then yeah, and then Stott tried to bunt. Yeah. Harper to to second, I, which why? Yeah. <laughs> like that, None of it made that made zero sense to me, and I, you know, nobody asked about it after the game because everybody else had, you know, you had other things. And then people, to talk yeah. About. One thing I would say is, and you, you know, this people are like, why, why isn't anyone holding these guys accountable? Like, uh, it's a valid question to ask. Like, what the hell was that? But you just yeah, had this yeah. huge win. Everyone's excited. Like, as a reporter, you're like, hey, uh, Rob, what'd you think of that bunt? Like, it's just out of context in that. Yeah, but, uh, to be to be fair. To be fair, and I'll give him props because Todd Zalecki asked the question, but Zalecki asked about Marsh not being able to get the bunt down. Bunt down, yeah, good. Right. I mean, so that's so that's a that's a that's a fair question. What did Rob say to uh, that? Was he like, oh well, you know, we don't. He's got to like, get it down. Yeah, good. Got to get down. Yeah. yeah, he said he's been working at it. He's he's better at he's better bunter, and he should get he needs to get that bunt down. So I mean, he you know he wasn't he didn't sugarcoat it. I mean he. He first, you know, try to say that, you know, he always talks about the players putting the work in, which is important because I do think that there is context to that. It's not like they're lazy and not doing it. They do work on bunting every BP. They're required to lay bunts down before they swing. So it is it is a thing that they do. Um, but he's got to get it down. And Rob said that. Rob said he's got to get it down. And he's right. Anything else you took away from this weekend? You're down there the entire weekend. Anything I missed? Maybe we missed? No, uh... We didn't We didn't get into – we really we, – we very high level said, oh, bullpen was great. But really, when you when you look at it, that bullpen right now is, is humming. Yeah. And if you can get Alvarado even remotely close to what he's supposed to be, it is only going to make it that much yeah. better come the postseason. Like it is humming right now between Kirkering and Strom and Hoffman and uh, Estevez. That if you add a fifth arm into that mix, like I, I don't know if there's another 
bullpen in the National League. I mean, obviously Cleveland's in the in the AL, but I don't know if there's another bullpen in the National League that can that can match with the with the Phillies. Like I like I that was what impressed me the most. I mean, I talked to Kirkering about how he got out of his stretch where he was not pitching well, and he basically it, it, it was like he was told the dumbest thing, and it's worked. So we're talking about it. And I said, I said, what do you think it was? And he said, well, he says, I'm never, I'm never afraid to be a guy to throw strikes. He says, I always have been a guy who throws strikes. He said, but I was a little bit on um, early pitches in the count, trying to get strikes on the black. He said, and they basically just said to me, just throw it, just throw a strike to get it, get ahead. He said, even if it's not a great strike, 70% of the time, the batters are going to get themselves out anyway. And so that's really what it was. He was like, "Oh, seven out of ten times, it's it's even if I just throw a cookie up there, they're gonna get themselves out anyway." And it's like, okay. And so ever since then, he's been just going after hitters, and he's been nasty. And so like, it's funny that it's something so simple that changed for him to be like, "Oh, all right, you, I I didn't realize that that's what the numbers were. Okay, I'll do that." And yeah. then it it made him and made him figure it out. Right. Um, look, Strom got into some trouble last night, but I don't know if there's a better pitcher in that bullpen or on this team for that matter to get out of dirty innings than Matt Strom. Yeah. He bears down better than anybody when he's got runners on base. And th this time it was of his own doing. It wasn't like coming in and cleaning up somebody else's mess, but he cleans up a mess great. Great. And he just did a really nice job on, um, uh, there, there's something Ar said Arcia and, to see wipe and out one, two, three, but I, I think that there is something to be said for getting yourself into a jam, having knowing that this is a huge spot. If you don't get out of this inning, you're probably going to lose the game. And you give him a lot of credit for locking in there and, and doing it. Um, even yeah. Kirkland, like, I mean, that inning started with a four pitch walk to Whit Merrifield. Like, yeah, you know, he, so you, the end result is great, but in the moment you're like, "Jeez, come on, man! Like, go get him." But well, you, you could, you could. So Harper said something to him. Uh, I don't know if you saw. If you go back and watch it, and and I didn't get to ask about it after the game again. There, there's so many other things we're working on writing about that these little things sometimes they get they slide through. But um, Kirkring has that four pitch walk, and then he looks over uh at harper and harper says something to him and you could see it on his face that kirkering was like yeah you're right you know like i got it and don't worry about it and i have a feeling it was one of those exactly what i was just talking about i was just yeah. like okay you got a little too cute with that guy just go get the next freaking hitter just yeah. start throwing strikes and i think that and he was like yeah okay and he gets the double play ball right yeah. away and it's like all right got out of it um so yeah like i think that i think that there's there's something to that like i, I don't know i look at this bullpen bob and I'm far more confident in this bullpen than I was in the bullpen going into the playoffs last year. Fair enough. So I don't, I don't, I don't know how you, if you look at it the I, same I mean, way. I mean, look, I've liked this bullpen all along. I, I certainly did not love that stretch that they went through and you start to pick it apart. I've never really wavered on Hoffman and Strom. Alvarado, I do think, is, is a little bit concerning. But Kirkering really is the wild card. If he can come in and be that guy, you just feel better about the entire thing. And Estevez is, again, big weekend. You feel better about him than maybe you did two weeks ago. But those those four guys, yeah, hey. Yeah. Serious. And, and Estevez was getting it up to 99 last night. Yeah. That, that's a tick up in velocity for him. Absolutely. So. All right. Um. Look. Do you? Uh. I guess you have one last thing, and we can wrap. Oh, yeah. It up so, yeah. We, and we kind of already touched on the Cubs a little bit, and this was I said earlier. This was going to be the one last thing. But here's the question, Bob: Are they good enough to get this last wild card? And here's why. Um. They've been great in August. Like they've been, I think, eighteen and eight, and they're in twenty six games in August. Like they've been really good. Here's the rest of their schedule. Three with the Pirates, who've completely fallen out of contention. Then it, this is their only tough stretch. Three with the Yankees, three with the Dodgers. After that, three with Colorado, three with Oakland, four with Washington. Those are all at home. Yeah. 
Uh, they come to play the Phillies for three, and who knows what the Phillies, where the Phillies will be at that point if those games matter or not. And they wrap up with three at home against the Reds. The it's schedule might easy, just power them because I don't love the Cubs. Like, I think that that team is very flawed, but they're obviously playing with some confidence right now. They've gotten it together. They probably feel it. They they probably feel that hey, we are there. We're in this thing. And then you look up at that schedule, and it's kind of hard not to think that they might make a run. Yeah, I, I we've been sitting here for a couple of weeks saying Braves or Mets, and I think the Cubs might actually be able to get in ahead of both of them at this point. <laughs> I, I just look uh, at it and be like, man. that's something, and I would not have expected that. No, I, you know, I certainly would not have a couple weeks ago. That. Yeah. Uh, what do you think about the, the Labor Day schedule? Are you of the mindset that every team should be playing today? Yes, yeah, every team I, I in baseball. Too. I hate it. I know the Phillies have been grinding here lately, but like, come on, man. Every team should play on Memorial Day, Fourth of July, and Labor, Labor Day. Day. I, it's a it's a weird miss for me. You know, it really, it really, truly and, is. And it's the second one the Phillies have missed this year. They also didn't play on Memorial Day. Yeah, they played on Fourth of July in Chicago. Um, they got crushed in that game if you remember they got blown out yeah yeah um but uh christopher sanchez yeah. i think and they got yes got rocked yeah. in that game yeah yeah, yeah. i yeah. mean if you're a phillies fan you're trying to follow the sport today and you're all you got the playoff fever you you do have the brewers and cardinals at two o'clock and then you have the dodgers and diamondbacks at 4 10 so there are some games of consequence on today but yeah that'll be a, that'll be a good one yeah that'll be a good one dodgers diamondbacks go. be lock in and, yeah, and and I it's a pretty good um, uh, pitching matchup if I'm not mistaken too. Uh, if I remember correctly, um, just pulled up here real fast. I'm pretty sure it was a good one uh, when I looked at it last night. Uh, yeah, Fla well, no, it's not. It's not a good one. I'm sorry. It's Flaherty who's been great for the Dodgers, and Rodriguez who's not necessarily been great for the Diamondbacks since coming back off of his injury. So. That's uh, basically a must-win game for Arizona if they have any designs of thinking about winning a division. Like, you've got to go get that one back. Yeah, yeah, they got you it. They, I mean, three out of four at home to them, but. Yeah, but I mean, I, I don't I don't think that there's there's enough to catch the Dodgers there. I, I mean, even either. if they win, even if they win, they get within four. Yeah. There's time, but I don't know. I don't, I don't see Basically it. Basically the exact same situation you were looking at last night with the Atlanta and the Phillies. You know, yeah. It, it's yeah. like. You're not winning the division, but you you can lock it up basically. You know the Dodgers yeah. are good enough that you wouldn't expect them to be able to get cut down by six games at the end of the season here. So, yeah, but I mean, are, are we are we kind of in agreement that Arizona, San Diego, even though it's far from over the wild card race, that they're kind of in a comfortable enough position to not fall out of it? Feels like it, yeah, it, yeah, and it's yeah. it's really down to Atlanta Mets Cubs for the last one. Yeah, yeah, okay, that's, I'm all right. That's what I think. I'm. I'm my World Series, our World Series predictions are teetering. By the way, that Orioles bullpen, like what they they blew it. Like you yeah. know what the Orioles, you know what I'd be nervous about if I were an Orioles fan, is that they've talked themselves into this this minor league pipeline so much that they're just pissing away championship opportunities in the short term. Like, yep. well, we got another top ten guy coming. Like that's cool. That's great. Huh. You you got bounced last year. Like, and that's fine. That that team was getting back to the postseason for the first time, but they they were the higher seed. They should have won that series. They didn't. Here you are again now. Inside track at maybe getting to a World Series. You do nothing at the deadline of significance. You you take the Philly slop. Zach Eflin was really good. And you know, look, I like Zach Eflin. It's a good move. But man, and I know that they've had injuries and like, that's all part of the equation. Like how many injuries can you really make up and account for? But back at that bullpen, you've got it. You had to do more than that. I'm close, Bob, at this point to changing my American League pick. Also, can we like real quick? I'm close. I'm not there yet. I'm st like, I'm staying with Baltimore for now, but I'm, like the I'm, Guardians, I'm, like what are they doing? The Twins have been nah, terrible. Like what are these teams in the Central doing? No, who You know who it's going to be? Go ahead. It's gonna be the Astros. Yeah, sure. It's gonna be the Astros. They're they're I, they have better pitching than the Yankees. And that's that's why I think it's. But I mean, I I would not be surprised if we're looking at Phillies, Dodgers, Astros, Yankees as your final as your final four teams. All of them are the big groans. 
they got uh, four of the biggest markets in it's great in, for the uh, networks the you know but it's yeah. just like man i hate all four of these teams if you're uh you know sitting there in cleveland or anywhere yeah. else for that matter you know yeah, but I think that's probably what you're looking at, and and it wouldn't surprise me if that's what it is. Um, I just think that the yeah, I, I look at the Astros and go, here to here to here comes this freaking team again. <laughs> I can see that. Yeah, I can see that. All right, well, for Anthony Sanfilippo, I'm Bob Wank. We'll be back on Friday. Uh, we will talk to you then.